No, no, Brennan, you can't stop there. You made such a great start. Oh, okay. Huh. All right, so I'm going to have to <laughs> evaluate uh, half of a fantastic effort. So that's great. That's fine. What am I here for? To look at these great scores. Okay, so <clears throat> I just felt that things were going so amazingly well. And, uh, yeah, I just, I just didn't want it to end. So let's look at the beginning of the score here. We've got a few overall balance problems. I, I just want to comment from the very beginning here that I really love the, um, the dynamic flexing. And it makes a lot of things possible that aren't normally possible in some of these evaluations. <clears throat> okay, so... Uh, you know, just looking at the harp here, for instance, while uh, you guessed it, Brennan, if you've been watching some of these other evaluations, this this fortissimo kind of 2T scoring it basically just leaves no, no room for the harp. The harp is going to be invisible. You know, big rolls or not, it's just too big. <clears throat> About the most that you could hope to accomplish here with this much mass in the scoring would be like um, like uh, like a glissando maybe right but right in here you have ample room for the harp to do something now the fact that it's being doubled by pizzicato is puts the harp at a disadvantage so you'd have to mark up the harp to mezzo forte right <clears throat> in order for it to be heard and actually Marking it up to mezzo forte and having the pitches pitched an octave higher than the than the pizzicato, I think you then it then the harp will come through beautifully clearly here, right? The mock-up, if you can hear it through the mock-up, it's lying to you. It really, you you know you, you have to think that this E right here is being played by a single string on the harp, whereas this E here is being played by <clears throat> say let's say sixteen. Sixteen players are plucking their open E string right here, and so what? Who do you think is going to win in this fight? Right. So anything you can do to differentiate these parts to maybe boost the harp up an octave and to mark it up to mezzo forte, then they've got a chance. And then here, mezzo forte crescendo to fortissimo and back. Right. And then ending in a roll is fine. However, this stuff right in here, not a chance. It just will not come through. The huge mass of uh, of ta of tone that you've got right here. Now maybe a glissando <clears throat> up to E an octave higher from you know very very low E down here within one or two beats. That'll be audible. All right. <clears throat> so let's um, let's apply the evaluation criteria. Starting with pitch weight in the upper middle register of the piano. That's not an issue. Thematic material repeating often, possibly sounding repetitive if orchestrated exactly the same way throughout. Well, maybe that is a problem, right? I mean, like here, you're, you're making a difference between the harp parts, right? More or less. <clears throat> but that is not going to make any difference because nobody can hear it, right? So um, you would have to come at it with something else. Is it possible to progress the texture in some way? Do you know what I mean? Whether it's like, uh, you know, say maybe there are some longer tones in some parts here, or maybe it started off with fewer parts and then got bigger. See, I'm not, not talking about doing something completely different the second time, but more just like just some way that, that the music starts to grow rather than just coming back around to what it did before. And that's not an issue in a situation where you're just writing this for a challenge and you want to know how well you're orchestrating and so, and so on. But what if, what if you were to take this very worthy arrangement and try to get it performed, right? And then that, that arrangement became extremely popular and got played thousands of times. Uh, you know, like, would you feel comfortable with that then, with this, you know, dead-on copy, right? One section to the other. So it's just like that, you know, what's the ultimate destiny of this particular arrangement? You know, sort of thinking 
in terms of an unlimited future of it, is it enough just to let these be copies of each other, right? Now, just looking at the <clears throat> at the scoring uh, in general, and including this, which I'll I'll comment and comment on a little bit more. I feel that like it is the kind of scoring where, in order to get it to balance, you really have to mark the um, mark the brass and the timpani down one degree. Right, so here, pianissimo, crescendo to forte. Forte and forte here. Because did you notice that you can't hear the yeah, da, 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 right in here? It's like it's blown out of the water by the, you know, by these this brass just protruding into the sound picture. It's so powerful that we cannot hear this yet da, 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 by the other instruments. And, and, and the yet da, da, da is a little underpowered too, right? I mean, there's... Could the seconds have played it? And all they're doing here is just holding an A. What if they were to, you know, to contribute a little bit to that, right? And there's also like a bit of a, there's like just a slight bit of a hole in the sound picture there. Yeah, just like, yeah, that slot right in there of that A. Yeah. So I'm not really hearing any kind of octave doubling from below. I'm just hearing like the octave on top. And then here we got some harmony right in there and in here, right? So, but that's not really strong enough to carry the melody. So it's really just relying on the, the piccolo and the first flute. So anyways, I'm, I'm getting ahead of myself here. But the main thing I was talking about was just the balance of the brass. It's just so scorching and so huge. It's blowing everybody out of the water here. So for this kind of concerted effort, I think you can you can easily mark down the brass and you'll get a beautiful balance. You'll, a lot of parts will come through much, much clearer. Now, <clears throat> as to this little diminuendo in here, I think you should start that diminuendo right in the middle of this beam group rather than right at the beginning of it. So did you notice it just like really loses power so quickly? You know, yeah, 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 da, 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 da. I just feel like, you know, you could easily do a, um, a terrace dynamic here. Da, 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 da. Do you know what I mean? And, the, you know, like the, the thing about it is I feel that this motive isn't dun, 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 dun. It's just dun 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 dun. That's it. Dun 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 dun. It's not dun 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 dun. You don't have to finish it with a B at the end. You can just go dun 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 dun. Right. Okay. So as to the, you know, as to the scoring in here, <coughs> you know, it's 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 all pretty nicely done. Yeah, just very stompy here. Your tuba, contrabassoon, double basses. Yeah, and that you know, I mean, to the de to the degree of force that you're putting into all of the harmony here, maybe the strings would be better off just playing B. Pl like the upper strings would be better off playing B octaves. You know, just B B B B, ya, da, da, da. and just bringing in more people. Uh, doubling this, yeah, dun, dun, dun. I mean, what is you know what's going on here with these, yeah, you know, with these A's in the second violins? Yeah, you know, are, are, how how are they really helping when they're <clears throat> when they're be where they're being played so powerfully by other instruments? Yeah, so you know you might as well be using your uh, your second violins to double. The melody right in here and then here like you have no strings right and then you're going to pizzicato so if you are holding off on d doubling the winds right in here with the strings because you wanted to give the players time to adjust to getting to pizzicato don't worry about it it's instantaneously they can be going bo 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 puck right? it's 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 a little annoying but it is possible okay so you don't have to you know, you, you don't have to be thinking so hard about that. See, because right here you're going straight from pizzicato to arco, right? So it's all good. All right. 
Yeah, but really rich, full, massive brass. Here you're just kind of following the Rimsky-Korsakov dictum of like doubling up the horns and so on. And in and then of course like the the other brass can be single, but like when you look at it, like like what are you doubling? You're doubling the E fourth. Or excuse me, the B fourth in the uh, upper trombones here. So you know what what how is that you know like you you end up with like uh like a quintuple e right being played so one trombone and two horns being played on each one of those so really like you're putting the focus more on the e than you are on the b right so we're not real the b is like is like less important of a note and it's it's not like the highest note in the trumpets right so like it really we're going to feel the push from the from the e more than the than we will from the b although the b will be audible right so that's another thing to think about in the way this is scored okay so now moving on to uh i feel that this is really nicely you know this is nicely done although like you know the kind of this all this repeated stuff you're doing more of this than you are of the actual melody, right? So how many parts are doing repeated notes, right? So you've got a repeated B from the second flute and the first oboe, right? And then you've got this repeated E with the second oboe, and then you've got the repeated B down here with the bassoons, and then uh, bass clarinet is doubling the re repeated E an octave below, and so on. So it's like, so they're there you've got one, two, three, four, five, six players doing those repeated chords, and you only have like three players playing the melody in a sort of a triple octave, right? So, you know, I mean, I I just feel it's the the melody is slightly underpowered here. You know, maybe like the repeating notes could just could just be um, could just be piano, and the melody note could be crescendo and diminuendo might be one way of balancing this but you know the the whole issue of the melodic development soaring quite high um you have managed that really nicely with the piccolo here and and everybody else i feel that that's a really strong way of dealing with this and then like having this element come out here now there is absolutely no reason this i think this was in the last this feature was in the last uh, evaluation as well. There's absolutely no, absolutely no reason why your first flute player can't come down and double on this D and C and then jump back to A. And that way the overtones of these two instruments plus the oboe will fill in uh, weight on the fundamental of the piccolo and uh, as well as the uh, clarinet. Yeah, I mean... It's just very, very cool. Why couldn't you go yum bum 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 and then bass clarinet come can come in and go yeah dun 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 dun, right? All right, because like you're right in here, you're starting to fill in some of those pitches in the winds, anyways, right? But like I said, pianissimo crescendo to forte, not piano crescendo to fortissimo. All right, and and like I said before, uh, you know the if you want the harp to contribute meaningfully, it'll have to be scored mezzo forte here. And even at that, it's a you know it it you know mezzo forte and ottava, and it'll be audible, but it'll still be fighting with all this stuff happening with the um, just you know these repeated chords in stretched across the wind section. It's a very cool idea. Don't get me wrong, uh, but but I I really do like the you know, harp aside, I really do like the way that the um, accompaniment figures are are covered across different instruments. I think that's a great way of taking it on, and the same thing here. All right, so speaking of which, on, on this section right in here, same thing I would say, you know, jump it up an octave, and then right in here have a really big rolled chord, you know, hand over hand, left, right, left, coming over the top, right? 
So way up an octave, right? And then you know what I mean? It'll just I think um I think that that would be the way to keep the harp relevant in here. And of course mezzo forte crescendo to fortissimo and back. All right, now as to the melody, you're continuing on with a sort of like repeated, the repeated chords and then the instruments playing along. And you know, once again, it's a, it's a little weaker, but I mean, I mean, it is sort of working the way you've got it scored, but I just worry that it's, that it, you know, that the, you know, in practice, like in theory and in the mock-up, it's sounding okay, but in practice, I think it's good that you've got, at least in this section right here, you've got the first violins. doubling the melody. I think that that's very important. And then here we got a straight shot in octaves. And yeah, I, I like the fact that you don't have, a lot of people are putting in piccolo like very high right in here. I think, you know, you, you hold it back until right here, you know, you just let it go and everybody's just running up at the same, uh, in the same way. One possible thing to think about is that the this particular uh, segment of the octave melody, which you know essentially starting from F and then this is the same thing transposed and then an octave lower and you've got that in viola right the same pitch as the second oboe and second clarinet. It just really feels like I can really feel it starting. Do you know what I mean? It doesn't feel so much like yeah, ba 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 ba. Everybody's going up to here. It sounds more like yeah, da 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 da. And then now we're starting in. We're joining in right here, right on this downbeat, right? It's just like the the fact that everybody is coming in and playing along is is just very, you know, it really really. I can feel the beginning of this right on that downbeat, right? So, I mean, how would you solve that? you'll have to think about it, I'd say, you know, or is it a problem? Maybe it's not, it isn't a problem to you. And you know, maybe starting pianissimo, I think might be a way of doing it. And then crescendo to fortissimo. And then it's a subtler beginning. You know, it'll be no less powerful on the last three notes. But, you know, maybe less obvious on the beginning. Anyways, add, add that to the mock-up and see what you think. And then here... You know, the, the, um, this is what your violinists want to see. All right. All right. You don't need to put the ottave in there. This is perfectly fine. And, you know, there's, this is, this may be a tip that I will write in the future, but like leaving the ottava line out really brings home the consequences of what you're doing right so it's like that you know like just throwing the like we're just used to throwing that in is like and it, it, I, if you are a you know if you are a keyboard player right um then you know this that it's just you know all you have to do is move your hand over and kind of use the same fingering and so on but for a wind player and a string player there is like a ladder <laughs> of or for a string player there is like a ladder walking across the strings of how you cross um you know laterally um or or perpendicularly to the string across the strings to climb up to this high e or um you know just depending on how this how you are fingering all of this there is a way of moving upwards right and then for the uh the wind player there are different overtones that have different sp specific positions. And you, as you start to get up there into the altissimo register, uh, you know, that it is not the same fingering that is just up an octave higher, right? It's just a bunch of different places. So, and there are really specific associations, visual associations with all of these things, right? And when you put the ottava mark on that, you take that away for some players. They just find it very irritating. Others compensate. They don't think it's a problem, all right? So anyways, I, I've... I've written extensively about this and made videos, so I'm not going to get into it more here. But uh, yeah, but I, I think that this, like, just showing us the high E, you know, the way that the player would want to read it, right? Or, or you know, going all the way up to high C or D for the for the wind player, 
Uh, it just really is is like bringing home the fact that you are asking something very, very serious of that player. They are going to have to work on it as their eye goes over the page. And you, as an arranger, are not just going to be throwing in Ottava things right and left and not, not thinking about it. You're really going to have to think about it when you see this huge stack of ledger lines. Okay? All right, so enough of that. All right, so right in here... You know, what is the big concern in the evaluation criteria? It is upper middle register continues on relentless if no textural contrast to previous passage, right? And I mean, there is a, there's a textural contrast to this previous four bars, right? And these in here, but of course, like right in here, it's really kind of the same, just bashing uh, timpani and and brass and so on it really is, is it is of a piece of what happened before but but i mean you know so there is a sense of relentlessness there but you know it I, essentially it's acceptable if you feel that that's acceptable but just throwing in the balance is what's important right just to get us out of this right and you know even with it balanced even dropping the brass to forte the harp still doesn't have a chance it's just too loud right and then I've, I've already registered my concerns about the melody being strong enough in here. I think you need a second octave in here that isn't, un, you know, that isn't a harmony part, right? So whether it's just dropping this, you know, this part onto here at an octave lower and maybe doubling it with first oboe or something like that, or, or maybe having your clarinets play in thirds or something with the first clarinet on the on the doubling the the new second violin part there's a bunch of different things that you could do here but you know pretty much like the at fortissimo right in here all of your internal wind uh, harmony is just you know is is useless right so you know, here you have um, sounding B-flat, sounding A, right? So where are those pitches in your brass? So you have a sounding B-flat here and a sounding A in your second trumpet. That will be enough to basically obviate anything that the second cl uh, clarinetist is doing here, right, at, at fortissimo. So at forte is more of a a more of a blend, not a balance, but a blend, right? Anyway, um, and then just overall, thinking about this page, how many accents do we need to import from the score, from the original piano score into this score? How much do, do there need to be that many accents here? You know, maybe there could be like no accents for these three bars and then just, you know, just an accent on the second beat, you know, bum, 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 Like we, we don't have to do everything that Faya says in the piano score. But, you know, other than that, it's really gutsy, full-blooded, <laughs> 2 tee scoring. Really enjoyable. Now, right here, um, you have this very cool section. I, I love the idea of the harmonic pad and the strings and the winds and everything, but I would say uh, fortissimo, excuse me, forte pianissimo <laughs> right here, instead of forte piano, really bring it down, right? See, yeah, and and then, and, and don't swell, right? Just leave the swell out. This, this the, the pad is starting to interfere. It's like it's imposing itself too much into this line. So, if you really want this to be forte piano, right, then you have to add some weight to this part here, right? Whether it is, say, you know, who's available, uh, say oboe and English horn, right, uh, would be good to double this with, and, and then you could get away with it. I think you need a, a, a dynamic right here at the beginning, right? So what is it, mezzo forte or forte, whatever, right, so. But maintaining a driving staccato, transitioning smoothly to the next passage, you really do that well, okay? And then I just love that you just release into this chord here. And from B, it's so nicely done. 
and really is kind of the part that I, I'm looking forward to evaluating the most. Things that are strong here, I really, really like the bustling nature of the, of the strings right in here. I feel like I can really hear the functions very, very well. This, you know, oh, dun, 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 dun. I, I think that works. And then the, the wonderful trade-off, you know, dun, 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 bu, 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 bum. I just think that that's so cool. And the little flutes coming over in the end. I think that that works brilliantly well. I think that if you're going to have a crescendo to mezzo forte, then you should write it in, right? Right in these spots. And, you know, here as well. And then you make this, you know, you make that first high E, um, or excuse me, you make that second high E a really organic part of the uh, melodic curve. So we've got the yep, bop, 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 bop. Uh, and then yata da da on the yata da da plink. I think it's really great that the the high E isn't the same. It's like it changes off, right? And then we've got that kind of late one coming in here. That was another concern, keeping high interjecting notes from sounding too glaringly repetitive, and I think just or even just glaring, right? Uh, so I think that I think that you you know you make them sound sort of like little bird chirps that are part of the music, right? That that underlying essential things rather than just kind of being random little beeps, and especially like that's aided right here by having this coinciding with the start of where your winds come in to sort of dovetail into the next function, right? The next little uh, motive. And then you're kind of coming back to this yump -a -bump -a -bump -a -bump -a -bump -a and then the lower strings we all I think you could get even stronger here going up to forte and, and mark it in both parts. Right here, you know, once again, if you want the harp to be a, a coherent part of this, you've got to mark it up. At least mezzo piano to forte, right? Uh, otherwise, I'd feel you just don't get a balance right in here, you know. Just you know, don't, don't be afraid to mark the harp up in a situation like this. Like if the entire passage were really soft all the way through, then I think, you know, yeah, you could just keep it the way it is. But with these, you know, with the the crescendo and everything else and the, the you know, the fact that we have this concern about maintaining differentiated roles and closely spaced melodies, overlapping accompaniment figures, highlighting inner voices, I think that that is a real concern, right? So so you, you manage to pull that off, right? good trade-offs, but then here is where we run into problems, right? Because while I have keeping triplets from overwhelming the melodic line above as a concern in the uh, evaluation criteria, here the triplets are just disappearing, right? They're just so soft. They are not coming through at all. And what's more, they're not true to the original um, you know, da da dum, da da dum, da 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 bum bum bum. You know what I mean? It's like they're going. Uh, here, you're you're basically taking this idea and you're kind of running with it rather than than following the original. You know, da 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 da. There there kind of is less when you're just going da 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 da. This really is not the same push, right? There isn't the same kind of growing sense of suspense and and you know cumulative energy, right? So I, I feel that by changing this motive in here, uh, this that you know we're or this little fragment, you 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 you're kind of you know you, you are defanging it in a way, right? It, you're making it less powerful, and then. You know that that the thing about it is that that contributes to a loss of differ differentiation in the roles because what keeps the triplets really um, differentiated in the piano score is the fact that is the fact that they go yada dum right da 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 they're 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 obviously a curve that is curving downwards every time rather than coming back and coming back and coming back. Right, and so when it when you have this situation, um, yeah, you know, I mean, it, I mean, it, it's cool, 
like like the way that you're like you're making this this cool little um you know, it's like contrary motion and it's harmony not octaves and all that other stuff i mean that is there's a really cool feature to it right don't get me wrong it's just that it stays around the same pitches right and especially stays around e an octave lower than the e and it and it sort of uh, it it not only is it hard to differentiate from the melody, but it also confuses the melody. Like the melody doesn't have as much separation now, right? So you have this E right in here. So it just needs to be more powerful at the beginning because I can't really quite make out that this is the melody, right? So if you maybe if you doubled it at pitch with the first, you aren't kind of doing anything else. Or maybe like added English horn there, like as just doubling it from, you know, to blending together. Just to bring it out a little bit, right? Because you're because you're giving so much strength. Like right here, you've got your bass clarinet, right? And uh, the bass clarinet is uh, getting involved with this as well. And it is, uh, you know, essentially doubling the uh, the viola from here. And so, like, you've got the bass clarinet and violas and the cellos working on the triplets, right, which are not coming through all, I mean, you, you can sort of barely hear them, and then you have the melody, but you can barely hear the melody too, right? So I think that the melody needs to be stronger from the beginning, right? So like, you know, what did I mark in the um, in the piano part was parentheses mezzo forte, right? So it is really, you know, it's not coming from somewhere and going to mezzo forte, it really is pronounced, you know, bum, 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 bum. And the you know the other parts around it could be just right under it, right? Because they, it's the differentiation is built somewhat into the into the curves, right? So, so I I just think that there needs to be a little bit more work in here. Is all I'm saying, right? And I mean I, I think that it's really cool what you're doing here with the harp and the uh, bassoon family. I think that that is really awesome, and and I think that the energy coming from below is great. Um, and and you know I love these little. You know this this little emphasis that you're bringing in with the uh, with the brass. I think that's all great too. But I think that the you know this could be coming in with the melody going to forte, right? See here, you got mezzo forte crescendo to mezzo forte. I don't understand that. Maybe you're thinking of getting crescendo, and now I'm going to go to mezzo forte. I'm just going to jump back down to mezzo forte from crescendoing to forte, and then go to piano, right? But look. You already need more power here if you're going to compete with the bassoon family and horns and clarinets, right? So, so this should be going, you know, this should be going crescendo to forte. I feel. All right, and then you can diminuendo to what, right? What's going on in the lower strings here? You got to tell us. So. Anyway, uh, yeah, so I just feel like there needs to be more weight on the melody. The melody needs to be really clear, right? And and here I think the accents aren't actually helping. What did I, what I mean there yeah, there are accents in the in the um, in the piano part, but yeah, I think it could could just be um, uh, tenuto marks all the way, right? Just really making each note really full. And then we get to this right in here and. And, you know, it's been kind of going on the same way for quite a while, right? There's, like, been no variation except for just adding the octave in the, uh, in the strings. And, you know, I, I'm wondering, you know, is there a way of addressing the final concern, keeping textural contours fresh and not too much the same, right? Is there some way of varying what's going on here and... You know, in and you know, without really changing from texture to texture, but to just you know to to progress the texture, if you know what I mean. You know, whether it is having different instruments double or or having things gradually change in color. I think you know what I mean. I mean, it's it's very cool. I love the timpani. I mean, there's so much that's good about this. Don't get the idea that I'm saying that this doesn't work, okay? But I just feel like, you know, I feel the original triplet uh, pattern works really, really well, right? And I mean, and I can see how you're sort of building the da da da, right? But like the thing is that with the with the you know the way that it is all structured, that we lose that sense of line, right? And then we also sort of like with the cellos on the bottom on the E, it confuses the 
the function of the melody between the melody and the and the triplet accompaniment i feel but i mean it, there's a lot that works and i really love the idea of the harp in here which of course should be marked up right okay and then we get to right here and this is all really cool i love this big chord right here in the brass and the and I feel it's just right here on this downbeat, you need everybody to have a dynamic. And you also need to have a dynamic at the end of this, right? Don't can't just let it like just just say like pianissimo or whatever, right? You just really want it to all fade off into nothing, right? So piano to pianissimo or or whatever, or triple P. And here we get into some real nitty-gritty. Now before I just jump into this melody, let's talk a little bit about the next you know, the, the first, I should say, the first concern right here, and that is convincing Alargondo expansion smooth release into bar 49. So I feel that, like, you know, doing this da, 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 um, I think that, you know what you could do here? Is have the Sforzando piano in the strings and winds and just have piano in the brass, right? So you're just going bum 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 all the way up, but you have the brass just going ya da 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 da, right? There, like the the brass don't need to go kachow at the beginning of every note, right? Or you can have the brass be you know adding the accents to the to every note as they go up, you know, forte forte maybe even forte pianissimo, and then have the other instruments just come in very softly, without hitting the having to hit the accents do you see what i mean so it really is like a piano then you have the you have the 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 ax the the attack hitting really nice and strong and then backing off and then you have the the mixed color sustaining afterwards right but like when all of the instruments are hitting the same accent then you get like kind of a mixed attack and and you know you you start to lose that sense of magic i think right but you you're onto the right idea you know the the whole pedal marking that's under the piano part is being realized by sustained pitches right but I, I think that the harp is just you know unless the harp is marked excuse me unless the harp is scored an octave or two octaves higher playing octaves or something then i i don't think it's going to come through right in here so you could go you could just have everybody going ba 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 then just have like a big nice rolled chord here at this at the beginning here I think would be more effective than this right in here and it's really lovely the way that you are interpreting this what if okay so a, a few things about this horn part so whenever you have two players who are playing very delicate octaves who should they be All right that's there's nobody else in the horn section you just have two players playing octaves you want the people who are sitting next to each other right so if the horn is just played if the first horn is just played a massive solo or if the first horn is just about to play a massive solo then give it to the third and fourth right just to just to let the first player rest their chops in a situation like this though you really you know you just want that you want absolute pinpoint accuracy you want you know with the with both the attack and the intonation first and second they're you know they are bonded together right so so this shouldn't be a fourth part this should be a second part and they should be on the same staff together okay now the next thing is why do you need an accent right shouldn't it just be you know um, um, I, I i just feel that that's it's just stronger to have uh, just stronger to have like a a single you know Without the, I think the accent is calling too much attention to itself, right? It, it, you sort of want the horns to be almost like a sustain to the pizzicato, though I know it's not the same pitch, right? But you just sort of, you know, you you're having this this pizzicato here, kind of um, adding some rhythmic punctuation, right? So the horns are a part of that rhythmic punch, punctuation. They don't need to have the accent on them, right? Because they're just saying, hey, hey, hey. Right, they're just like they're just really being a prominent part of the background, rather than just like a, a color that is that is pulsing, right? And you might even be able to mark them down to pianissimo, right? So, anyway, so so consider 
bringing down the the intensity of the brass or excuse me of the uh, horns in here and making it just a simple octave for the first and second okay and then yeah this is this is lovely right in here and the and the little you know high f kind of singing away up there And your, you know, little oboe solo. Okay, so, you know, one last thing here is, um, you know, here I had uh, a, a little concern keeping uh, or careful treatment of the melodic voice to make it feel authentic to the composer's style. That's great. And then, of course, one thing just to mention really quickly, keeping the accompaniment pattern from becoming too regular and too predictable. I think that you accomplish that by just, you know, having some changes occur throughout it and so on. Okay, but you know, back to this, I feel that like, you know, just because the piano score doesn't have any nuances to the melody doesn't mean that you should leave any out, right? Uh, what does it say? It says, um, uh, um, very singing like and expressive in the melody right so that's that's what the you know you just you know he wants this to be like a you know a very spanish sounding song you know so if you just to sing this to yourself you know what do you end up what kind of nuances do you end up with whatever they are put them in the score right so, da, 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 da. I see this as a crescendo and then a diminuendo. And then crescendo, da, 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 da. And then a burst, a, like put a stress right here, like a, an accent or a tenuto mark. Da, diminuendo. And then maybe, you know, you could even have the speed diminuendo here. Da, 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 da. Then crescendo, da, da. Diminuendo, da, da, da. And then crescendo, da, 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 da. See what I mean? There's like a lot. It's like punctuation in a sentence, right? You don't have to overdo it, but and some things are sort of obvious, but there should be a few hair point, hairpins in here, I feel, right? And then here you are, this lovely trade-off, you know, like you're going to four-part harmony in your horns, this, this beautiful pad, you know, and this, you know, going to the... Uh, the uh, strings right in here. I feel that's really effective, really nice. And, you know, I, I love the cellos doubling the lower horns here and so on, right? And this kind of push upwards. I, I don't think the harp is going to, I don't think this is going to come through in the harp, but I think this could, big rolled chord and, and leave the values, like the, the note value should be um, a dotted half note, okay? All right, so... <laughs> Um, really, really fun looking through that. And, um, you know, I mean, I, I, I wish that you had kept going and I'm sure that you did too. And, and maybe ran out of time or something like that, or that was all you could think of for this score. And that's perfectly fine. Uh, but you know, it, it was definitely worth looking at more and, and, you know, I would, I would, would have been happy to go over an hour talking about everything else that you might've come up with. So yeah, you know, but this gave me, you know, giving you some extra time uh, on on fewer bars. I hope that that has helped you just think about different things. I mean, I mean, there's not there's not really all that wrong with this, right? There's just a few balanced things to think about, and maybe you know, maybe changing things up a little bit. Um, as I was saying, progressing some textures, uh, you know, maybe maybe making some small changes that actually do have an effect of, of making the may, making things feel like there's more change happening in the score and so on. So, yeah. Um, so really good work, Brennan. I just really, um, it's, it's great to get uh, an entry like this, even if it's incomplete. And, you know, great to look over your score. Uh, I think you've been around the orchestration online community for a while, and it's been, you know, it's been awesome to have you uh, as a member and you know to get to get an entry from you on a uh, uh, orchestration challenge i think that you will you know the the 2022 excerpt that we're going to be orchestrating i think will 
really play to your sensibilities and it would be really it would be awesome to see what you make with you know section a and section b and especially section d of that if you can you know it's, it gets more it gets more and more complicated <laughs> like how to solve the problems of this particular excerpt even though on the surface it will seem very simple and you'll think oh yeah you know yeah, I, I, I think I understand how to do this, but like the more you dig in, I think the more you'll run into things where it's maybe not as not so easy. Anyhow, um, I'm not going to give anything away with, with that, but just say that I would be great if you could join us for that. And so thank you so much for the score. Thank you for your support on Patreon. Thanks to all the Patreon supporters for making this possible and so many other things possible on the channel. I, mean, I absolutely could not do it without you. I mean, thanks to you all, your support over the years, I've been able to um, you know, provide hundreds of hours of resources and thousands of pages, uh, just a lot of which are free on the internet for anybody to read, you know. There must be, I think, 80 or 90 tips that you can go and read, and, and also blog posts and uh, access to different resources, um, some of which I periodically update, like, you know, if you want to go see what kind of scores are available and so on. Um, for for studying for film, you know, there I now have a list of that and so on. So, anyway, um, what a great community it's it's super to have all of you involved with this and you know whether you're just a viewer or you've you're a contributor whether it's patreon or one of our awesome website subscribers sending us a score it all makes a difference so keep up the comments keep up the involvement keep watching these videos and the grand finale will be coming very soon see you all in the next evaluation